Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Ryland's Lunchtime Seminar Series. My name is Guido Armstrong uh, and I'm the Director of the John Ryland's Research Institute at the University of Manchester and I'll be chairing this session today. The Ryland's Lunchtime Seminar Series highlights the breadth and the quality of our unique special collections and showcases world-class collections based research activities from across the university. Today's session is coming to you from various rooms in the historic John Ryland's Library on Deansgate in Manchester and also from various rooms across the north of England. Um, and as usual, we'll be showing some of our outstanding artefacts from the collections and presenting new research on them. Our seminar today is entitled Fossil Histories in the Archive, and like you, I'm excited to learn more about it. Before I introduce our speakers, there's just a few things to mention, as usual. Um, this event is being recorded and it will be edited and made available on the John Rylands Library YouTube channel. Auto subtitles are available for you using your own settings. We're using the Zoom webinar trans, um, format, so that means that your camera and microphone is disabled on entry. And at the end of the session, we should have about 15 minutes for questions. So if you'd like to add one, you can add them to the Q&A function um, at any point during the talk. Uh, these will be selected by me at the end as the chair, and then I'll relay them to the speakers. So we should have time to take a few questions. We're aiming to stop around 12.45. So without further preamble, I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. First of all, Dr. Amelia Bonier was educated at the universities of Tokyo and Heidelberg, and she's currently a lecturer in the Global History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the Center for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the University of Manchester. Her first monograph, The News of Empire, Telegraphy, Journalism and the Politics of Reporting in Colonial India, C, uh, circa 1830 to 1900, was awarded the American Historical Association's 2017 Eugenia M. Palmigiano Prize for the best book in the history of journalism. Amelia's most recent project explores the global entanglements of paleontology in 20th century India, including connections to Japan and Germany, and the role of women in earth sciences more generally. Amelia is very committed to interdisciplinary research and she regularly shares her work with younger audiences via the medium of children's books, documentary theatre and school talks. Presenting with Amelia today is our very own Tabitha Tuckett. Tabitha is Research and Postgraduate Development Manager in Curatorial Practices at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library and Lecturer in Library and Archive Studies at the University of Manchester. Formerly the Rare Books Librarian at UCL, she's also worked for the libraries of Magdalen College, Oxford and the Warburg Institute. She's taught at UCL, Oxford and Newcastle and researches early modern print culture and historical music performance. So thank you both very much for talking to us today and over to you. Thank you very much, Guida. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about the collection items we're going to see today from the John Rylands here behind me. And we're going to see it with this wonderful camera, which is why you see a large vertical object in the middle of your screen. So we're going to see materials from the Manchester Museum on the history of that museum, which began with an organisation called the Manchester Natural History Society, which was founded in 1821. Not long after, in 1868, that society was dissolved and the collections were given to Owens College, which is one of the predecessors of what is now Manchester University, or the University of Manchester, I should say. So not soon after, just a few years in the 1870s, Owens College decided to found its own museum. And that's where these collections were based from then on. The museum was founded uh, for research and for public viewing of the collections. And that combination continues now as part of the University of Manchester. And those collections include botany, zoology, geology, anthropology, archeology, span Egyptology, uh, numismatics and archery as well. Now, what we'll see today are records from the archive of the Manchester Museum, and they come in two parts. The first part are the records of that first organisation, the Natural History Society. They are council minutes, curators meetings, and the records of the Natural History Club. The second part of the archive are records of the later organisation, the Manchester Museum. So they are committee minutes, 
um, financial records, visitors books, uh, cuttings and director's files. And I think what this gives you as an overall archive is a really good picture of the connections between uh, museums, academic research, and public engagement over that period from the mid 19th century to, to today, actually. And in, with that larger picture, you really get a good idea of the history of collecting. Now, we're going to put some links in the chat for you so that you can explore the catalogue of that archive and also look at the collections of the museums. But now I'm going to hand over to our speaker today, Amelia, over to you. Thank you so much, Tabata and Gaida, also for inviting me to present my work uh, as part of this uh, forum. Let me just share my slide first. Um, I think you should be able to see it now. Um, so the research I'm presenting today is part of a broader agenda that seeks to bring attention to the Indian subcontinent's uh, neglected histories of natural heritage, with a particular focus on its rich fossil record. I suspect uh, we are all well familiar uh, with the famous T-Rex, uh, not least because of dinosaurs like Stan, uh, seen here in festive attire in the Manchester Museum's uh, Fossils and Dinosaurs Gallery. Uh, but how many of us know that dinosaurs once also roamed uh, the Indian subcontinent? And one example was uh, Barapazoras, a large sauropod that lived in the early Jurassic about 170 million years ago. The fossil record of the Indian subcontinent also includes uh, many dinosaur eggs, which are more difficult to find than bones. So, for example, during the past four decades, um, uh, several nesting sites of titanosaurs have been discovered in central India. Uh, these, are, these were very large herbivorous dinosaurs that lived about uh, 70 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period. Now, I'm not a paleontologist, uh, but a historian of science. So instead of digging fossils out of the earth and subjecting them to uh, scientific scrutiny, I have been searching institutional archives for clues about their socio-political and economic afterlives, how they were excavated and studied, how they were used for teaching purposes or to establish the location of natural resources like coal and oil, how they were incorporated into projects of empire and nation building, forgotten or displayed in institutions like museums for the entertainment and edification of a broader public. Take, for example, this recently rediscovered specimens from the Shivalik Hills uh, in the outer Himalayas, donated in 1836 to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History by Lewis Robert Stacey, an officer in the Bengal Native Infantry. I was, a part, uh, uh, I was part of a group that published an open access uh, paper on the genealogy of this collection, and my colleagues established that some of the specimens are likely annotated in Ma Mary Buckland's pen which makes them important not only for the history of science in British imperialism in South Asia, but also for the history of women in science. Similarly, this agate specimen I recently photographed at the Natural History Museum in London was most likely collected in central India sometime before 1843 by another East India Company servant, a man named Charles Fraser. The specimen was registered in the British Museum's mineralogy collection in 1883 but curators at the Natural History Museum recently established that it is an unrecognized dinosaur egg. This means that it was collected about eight decades before the first confirmed discovery of dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert in 1923. So put simply, fossils from the Indian subcontinent have been hiding in museums around the world, not only the strata of the earth. They are waiting to be rediscovered by scientists and historians of science, for example, for the purposes of taxonomic reassessment, or to think about important questions in the history of science, as I hope to show, to show in my talk. To date, this research has been funded by the German Research Council through an individual grant for a three-year project, uh, which was based at the University of Heidelberg between 2020 and 2022. And for that initial project, I followed the journey of fossils from the Indian subcontinent into museums abroad, to understand why they collected such specimens in the first place and how they incorporated them into their own institutional imaginary. And except for the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, the collections I examined were located outside the UK at the Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven, the paleontological collection at the University of Tübingen in Germany, 
and the Tohoku University's Museum of Natural History in Japan. But I'm currently expanding that work with the help of a pilot grant from the John Rylands Research Institute, this time trying to document the history of the collections of, uh, collection of South Asian fossils in the Manchester Museum. And I should say that this project has benefited from the support of two scientific collaborators, uh, Professor Ashok Sani, uh, one of India's best known paleontologists who discovered some of the dinosaur eggs uh, I mentioned earlier, and uh, David, uh, Dr. David Gelthorpe, curator of earth sciences at Manchester Museum. Dr. Kath Reed also joined the project as a research assistant, helping me identify relevant literature and sifting through old issues of the Manchester Guardian. Now, unlike the fossil collections in American, German, and Japanese institutions I had examined previously, which had been acquired in the first decades of the 20th century, British collections like the one in Manchester, the Natural History Museum in London, or Oxford were products of the 19th century, whose circumstances of acquisition were inextricably connected to British imperial power in South Asia. And let me use an um, elephant to illustrate this point, uh, more specifically uh, the teeth of prehistoric elephants. The Manchester Museum's collection of South Asian fossils is small, uh, certainly by comparison to the ones at the Natural History Museum in London or the Yale Peabody Museum. There are altogether 14 specimens in this collection, all of them about 3 million years old, all of them collected in the Shivalik Hills in the outer Himalayas. Of these 14 fossils, half are remains of elephant ancestors belonging to a group of herbivores known as proboscideans, the broader mammal group that includes elephants and their extinct relatives. Six of these proboscidean uh, fossils are teeth, which tells us two important things about archives, be they archives of the earth or more conventional museum collections. One, that teeth are more likely to be preserved in the fossil record than other body parts, which disintegrate easier, for example, skin. And two, that there was an appetite for collecting elephants, both prehistoric and contemporary in the 19th and early 20th centuries, an appetite that went hand in hand with a broader and fairly global scientific and public fascination with these animals. And as you can see in this slide, this trend was also demonstrated by another famous inhabitant of the Manchester Museum, Maharaja the Elephant, whose garlanded skeleton now greets visitors at the entrance. Now I'll stop sharing uh, my slides now so you can see the record. because the archives of the Manchester Museum offer additional clues in this respect. For example, at a meeting of the Natural History Club in September, 1863, the secretary showed some, I quote, magnificent Indian butterflies, which had been presented to the Manchester Natural History Society by James Aspinall Turner, a cotton merchant and entomologist. The specimens came from a large collection of butterflies created by one of Turner's sons, was a resident in India at the time. At the same meeting, the secretary also showed the tooth of an Indian elephant with the grinding surface public. In other words, the Manchester Museum's collection of South Asian fossils might be small, but it acquires significance as part of an imperial and global network of institutions that collected natural history specimens from the Indian subcontinent in the 19th and 20th century. The archival records I examine suggest that such specimens were often presented, between inverted commons, by individuals connected to the region, usually people who returned from service in India or had relatives there. They were also presented by collectors who amassed eclectic assemblages of natural history specimens from all over the world. As you can see in this list of donors and donations to the Manchester Natural History Society which shows that in 1861, Captain Thomas Brown, naturalist and curator at the society, donated a butcher bird from Australia, a lapwing from Bombay, and 16 shells from the Philippine Islands. The South Asian fossils were thus part of a broader attempt to collect the natural world of the British Empire and beyond within the walls of the Manchester Museum. But how did the fossils end up in Manchester? I'm going to show my screen again. Okay. 
there is little documentation associated with the museum's assemblage of South Asian fossils, and this is generally true of all the collections I examine. The Yelpe Peabody collection is an exception in this regard, since most of the fossils were collected during two scientific expeditions to the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, organized by the university in the first half of the 20th century, the Yale North India Expedition of 1932-33, and the Yale Cambridge India Expedition of 1935, both led by German geologist and explorer Helmut Letera, who was based in the US at the time. The Yale collection is one of the earliest examples when locality information was systematically recorded for South Asian fossils on field tickets, maps, and most importantly, G. Edward Lewis's diaries, the paleontologists associated with the 1932-33 expedition. Such information is vital for the scientific study of fossils, but is unfortunately missing for most of the fossils collected by British colonial administrators, military men, engineers, doctors, missionaries come explorers in colonial South Asia in the 19th century. So there is something to be said here about efforts to decolonize natural history museums, namely that decolonization is an exhausting task. Piecing together histories of acquisition from very fragmentary records requires a lot of work and effort. Imperialism, as we all know, was predicated upon the hierarchical ordering of people and forms of knowledge, an exercise which often rendered those at the bottom of the hierarchy invisible, such as the locals who found and excavated fossils, while also helping to obscure the power asymmetries and extractive logic that underline the making of many of these collections. It is telling, for example, that the Natural History Museum in London possesses only a handful of fossils from Japan, many of which are presented by the renowned Japanese paleontologist Matsumoto Hikoshichiro, either as original or casts. Similarly, there is about half a cabinet of fossils from China. The fossil collection from South Asia, by contrast, occupies row after row of cabinets. And this is not only a matter of numbers, it's also a matter of size. The biggest fossils from South Asia I have seen today can be found at the Natural History Museum in London. Now, the Manchester Museum didn't boast the prestige of the British Museum, the precursor of the Natural History Museum, which means that it wasn't the first choice for the stewardship of large collections of fossils brought over from colonial South Asia in the 19th century. The most famous of which were the 300 plus chests of fossils collected in the 1830s in the Shivali Hills by Captain Proby Cotley, an irrigation engineer responsible for the construction of the Doab Canal. As my colleague Pritza Nair has shown, that collection and its subsequent scientific investigation by Cotley and his associate the surgeon botanist Hugh Falconer played a central role in popularizing the Shivalik Hills rich mammalian fossil record in Britain and beyond. So much so that Falconer and Cotley's fossils traveled as duplicates or casts all over the world to university museums in Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester, Edinburgh, Berlin, Bonn, and Tohoku, the Imperial Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg, the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, and even the da Danish government. I'm going to stop sharing my slides again so you can see the records. Indeed, in 1848, the secretary of the British Museum invited Captain Thomas Brown to London to, I quote, make a selection from the duplicates of the valuable collection of fossil bones of animals brought home by Major Cotley, uh, Cotley and Dr. Falconer from the Himalaya Mountains, India, end of quote. According to an article published in the Manchester Guardian in, eight, in March 1848, Brown traveled to London and selected fossils, I quote, to the extent of two tons, 200 weight, which are now in the museum, Peter Street. They consist of portions of extinct mammalia and reptiles of gigantic size, such as the Shivatarium, a four-horned quadruped, the mastodon, elephants, crocodiles, hogs, and tortoises, end of quote. At this point, let us remember that there are currently 14 fossil specimens from South Asia in the collection of the Manchester Museum. What happened to the rest? Now, I must disappoint you and say that unfortunately, this is a loss I am yet to document. What I do know, however, as you can see in this record as well, is that a decade later, in the late 1850s, the Manchester Natural History Society wrote to the British Museum to request donations of duplicate specimens, 
not necessarily from South Asia. The museum refused, pointing out that, I quote, all duplicates were sold by public competition. To make matters even more confusing, according to the register of the Manchester Museum, most of the South Asian fossils now in their collection were acquired from the British Museum in the 1880s. But institutional memory can be fecal. Some of the specimens seem to have been lost and found again in the museum's geology cellar in July 1910. I'm going to share my screen again. Around the time Shivalik fossils were being rediscovered in Manchester, they were also being incorporated into the institutional imaginary of the Tohoku Imperial University in northern Japan with the help of paleontologist Matsumoto Hikoshiro, the same scientist who donated fossils from Japan to the Natural History Museum in London. A graduate of the Tokyo Imperial University, Matsumoto joined Tohoku in 1914, three years after the establishment of the Department of Geology, eventually becoming a professor there. Now, geological collections at universities were usually built around the research interests of members of staff. And Matsumoto was instrumental in building Tohoku University's collection, which includes several specimens from South Asia. For example, this cast of a Shivaterium skull acquired in 1912 from English geologist Robert Damon, who supplied museums in the Americas, Australia, and Europe. There is also the tooth of a prehistoric elephant called Stegodon Ganesha, after the elephant god, which Matsumoto described as follows in a 1915 publication. I quote, I have a specimen which has been figured by Falconer and Cotley under the name of Stegodon Ganesha for comparison, end of quote. Indeed, Matsumoto's specimen is the same as the one featured in Falconer and Cotley's famous book on the fossil geology of the Shivalik Hills, Fauna Antiqua Shivalensis, published in 1846. Since none of these fossils feature in the records of the Tohoku University, it is likely that Matsumoto paid for them himself, more so because other specimens, not from South Asia, purchased from German and French fossil dealers are mentioned in the records. Matsumoto went on to become an authority on elephants, and he was one of several Japanese scientists who made significant contributions to the study of elephants in the first half of the 20th century. So fossils have often been described as archives or libraries that store the deep past of the planet, but each of this collection is, as I hope to have shown, an archive of different temporalities. As objects of scientific investigation, they provide epistemic access to the deep past, but they also help to weave that past into the politics of the present and the making of the future. Removed from their original abodes in the Indian subcontinent and stripped of the meanings attached to them in those contexts, Fossils were incorporated into museums elsewhere, acquiring new meanings as they, as they were made to fit institutional agendas and imaginaries. Indeed, it wasn't uncommon for British collectors and the newspaper press to narrate this process of displacement and emplacement of fossils as an act of sending them home to London, Manchester, or Oxford. The discovery and subsequent study from the early 19th century onwards of sizable collections of mammalian fossils in the Shivalik Hills, of which Falconer and Cotley's was the most famous, rendered the South Asian fossil record relevant to scientific investigations on prehistoric fauna, not only in Britain, but also beyond in countries like Japan, prompting reflections on East and South Asia's interconnected deep past. South Asian fossils became important for purposes of comparison and correlation, especially after fossil remains of prehistoric elephants were unearthed in Japan and other parts of East Asia. In short, fossils can help us investigate histories of natural heritage, which are poorly documented, certainly by comparison to cultural heritage. They also help us reflect on how natural heritage enters the remit of debates about the decolonization of museums and science by offering a lens through which to reflect on the relationship between science and imperialism, the role of women in science, or the erasure of no local knowledge and labor in processes of fossil discovery and investigation. Fossils also help us reflect on the importance of materiality in the history of science and redefine the very notion of an archive as something that doesn't just include written documents, but also the specimens themselves 
and the ephemera associated with them, uh, such as field tickets or museum labels, as we can see with this prehistoric elephant tooth from the Manchester Museum. Working across a range of historical materials can be a good antidote to institutional amnesia and the loss of historical context that has often accompanied the incorporation of these specimens into museums. Equally important is working across collections of fossils, not least because tracing the circumstances of acquisition of the specimens is often difficult due to the lack of relevant documentation. And I thank you very much for listening to my talk and for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Amelia. I'm just waiting for my screen to come back on. Hello, everybody again. Um, no, thank you so much, both of you, for that absolutely fascinating talk. It was great to see to see the actual documentary records um, with Tabitha and then to hear you frame them in their context. Um, I'd like to invite our listeners to start putting their questions either into the Q&A or into the general chat. Um, but I think I might just exert my chair's privilege and ask you the first one, if I could. Um, so, I mean, fossil histories is not my subject, um, but I am always very interested in, I suppose, the condition of women. So could you say a little bit about the women who are involved in this work in this sort of in the first phase of paleontology in um, in this region? So I wasn't expecting to find many women when, when I started this project, precisely because of this general idea that there were not many women working in earth sciences because of the difficult fieldwork component, especially when you work in India. Um, you have to go into the Himalayas. Uh, and then I started uh, to uh, interview <laughs> geologists and, you know, earth scientists uh, and paleontologists uh, from South Asia. And uh, uh, they told me that that was one of the best things about <laughs> this kind of work, you know, going out of, uh, into the Himalayas, into the mountains or other difficult terrain, and that they were not scared at all. Uh, 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 contrary to the you know, common perception that this was something they wanted to avoid. And so I started to look at my historical records with different eyes and I started to you know, check the footnotes. <laughs> and I realized that because I didn't focus for my, for my bigger project, I didn't focus only on paleontology, uh, but also paleobotany, uh, that there were quite a few women who worked, especially um, examining um, fossil spores. Um, uh, so usually they, this is an interesting uh, aspect that men tend to work with um, uh, bigger fossils like, uh, you know, dinosaur bones, but women often did the kind of work that uh, meant, you know, sitting long hours uh, uh, at the microscope and uh, examining fossil spores, right? But having said that, uh, there are also people like uh, 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 Pamela Robinson, who was a vertebrate paleontologist, and she played an important role in, in promoting this field in uh, post-colonial India. So she went to uh, Calcutta uh, to join the Indian Statistical Institute in the 1950s, and she established a geological uh, uh, studies uh, uh, un uh, geological unit there, uh, and uh, she was involved in uh, several uh, uh, expeditions with uh, uh, Indian paleontologists, which uh, led to the discovery of uh, important fossils. Uh, and then there were the women who were not trained as professional scientists, uh, but who joined their husbands on expeditions in the Himalayas. Uh, or for conferences, or uh, help their husbands build in, uh, enduring institutions of education. So, for example, one uh, is the uh, Bill Bassan Institute of uh, Paleo Sciences, which was established in the 1940s and still exists today. And after Bill Bassani, the, the original founder, passed away, his uh, wife, Savitri Sani, uh, led the institute for two decades. Uh, and she was not uh, trained as a scientist at all, but she still performed uh, this kind of work. Uh, and it just made me think about the role, the often unacknowledged role that women have played in establishing institutions of education, right? Even when that benefit future generations of scientists, and you know, even though they were not trained as scientists. And it's it's great that the I suppose the kind of like the folk memory amongst the academics recognizes the contributions of these women. I mean, so you know, it's a kind of gentlewoman's pursuit, I suppose, at the start, that kind of explore explorer impulse, and then the wives, which makes me think of all of that, you know, that kind of thanks for typing. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. And then, do you know anything about the other women? Obviously, there would have been loads of women involved in these expeditions, um, local women. 
you know people who were sort of servicing the expedition yeah. is there so anything any record of those of those people I've only seen, this is an interesting, and also in India, there are considerations of caste as well that need to be taken into account. And it's very interesting because locals participated in many guises in these expeditions, but it's mostly men that I've seen. So there's only one image I've seen, and it was in the, from the 1950s, I think, uh, during an archaeological excavation in which, you know, men um, were on one side, or the right side of the picture were the men, and they were... Uh, uh, the digging, uh, so excavating the earth, and the women on the left side of the picture, uh, they were removing uh, uh, the soil and taking it to a different location. But that was the only time when I saw local women featured. Mm -hmm. and other, otherwise, they tend to feature, for example, in, in, a, uh, in a picture taken at the uh, 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 Geological Studies Unit at the Indian Statistical Institute, when they um, showed um, fossil discoveries, and then they would uh, appear uh, as you know, the wives of uh, uh, mm. those, people. but yes, that's yeah. that's so even uncovering certain hi histories, there are also histories that are not written or not captured. No, I mean, it's it's absolutely fascinating. I have yeah. learned a lot. Um, I was going to say we can take questions if anybody wants to put any questions in. Um, I will ask another one if we want. Um, I, I also really liked your label, uh, the label that you showed from yeah. the Manchester Museum. And I suppose, you know, that's that's something else that I find very interesting, the kind of histories of description, the kind of evolution of what people think they're doing. Um, is there anything that you could say about that, about your methodology or? Yes. So when I, I actually, so this project started in January, 2020. And that's, as we all know, that's when the pandemic started, which meant that out of a sudden I couldn't go anywhere. So I was, uh, stuck, so to speak, in, in Heidelberg, in Germany, and I was looking for ways to rescue the project, right? And I started off by contacting museums uh, uh, and archives in Germany uh, and requesting uh, uh, materials, uh, uh, copies, uh, PDF copies, basically, of the materials related to uh, India uh, and Indian geology and paleontology they had, because there's quite a, quite a few connections between uh, Indian and German paleontology. Uh, and then, uh, because uh, of uh, the paleontologists uh, I was working with at the time, Professor Ashok Sani and Dr. Uh, Advai Zucker, who was based at Yale, I started to learn more about the fossil collections themselves. And I started uh, to think about going into the collections, right, and actually looking at the specimens and see what kind of ephemera associated with them I could find. But it wasn't possible during the first two and a half years of the project because of the pandemic. So I that it was, I think, already in 2022 when I finally managed to, to go to uh, the Yale Peabody and uh, look uh, into their collection. And that really opened my eyes to this you know, material history of paleontology, uh, including the fact that, uh, and this is something that's relevant for the Manchester Museum as well, the fact that... Uh, Fossils that are on display are very prepared, so they're very look very polished compared to the ones you see uh, in the collections themselves, right? Um, and I often think that, so for example, uh, at the Yale Peabody, they had an unprepared uh, uh, rhino. A body, I forget what exactly which body part exactly it was, but I think it was a, a part of a rhino. Uh, which was unprepared. So it's hard to tell actually the difference between a rock, you know, and a, a bow, uh, unless you prepare it. But it does tell you so much about the history of paleontology, about the, uh, you know, the way in which fossil preparators actually work with these fossils, and then, you know, the label, the old labels that are attached to them. And I feel that, you know, by displaying such specimens in museums alongside the ones that are very polished, uh, you know, the visitors could actually learn a lot about the history of paleontology and the history of science. So I'm hoping to convince the Manchester Museum to bring some of those old possibilities, you know, out of the storage and display them alongside the, the one they already have. There's one in the fossils and dinosaur gallery. So visitors can actually look at them and, you know, ask questions about, you know, the history of science. That's, that's Yeah, that's such an amazing example because obviously, you know, these are objects that live for, uh, you know, Yes. Millennia, yes. you know, yes. in, in the terms of, you know, in, in terms of these things. But, you know, it, and we can look at any point in the life of that object to, to exactly. make them. With yes. the and um, also some of them, you know, they, they're quite easy to break sometimes. So then, you know, glue 
is used to, <laughs> to glue them back together. And so there are many debates in paleontology about the kind of material that's best suited for that kind of mm -hmm. process, right? Uh, but you can see it when you look at certain fossils, you can see that this was broken and then someone, you know, preparator glued it back together and... Uh, Thank you. I've got an excellent question here from Sasha Handley, um, which I think kind of almost could follow on from what you've said. And I think I'd be interested in asking both of you about this. Um, you might see it on your screen anyway, but I'll read it out. So she says, I was very interested in what you said about how your work alters our conception of the archive to decenter texts and manuscripts. What would be your ideal definition of an archive that encompasses objects, materials, as well as texts? So, yeah, so I, I think I already addressed uh, some of the, uh, this uh, uh, in my previous answer. But uh, as I said, when I started off, I really focused uh, uh, only on uh, uh, written records, you know, or printed records. And uh, now it's definitely, uh, although I have to say that my first uh, uh, monograph uh, um, on uh, telegraphy and journalism in Colonia South Asia also looked to a certain extent at uh, um, telegraph instruments and uh, uh, underwater cables and, you know, uh, material things like that. But I wasn't so invested, I think, in that approach as I am now after going into the, the fossil collections and, you know, looking even at the way in which they are uh, uh, stored. It's a very vertical way of storing fossils as opposed to books, which are usually, uh, you know, horizontal. <laughs> Um, and so now I think my ideal definition of an archive is, uh, you know, something that uh, involves different types of uh, historical records and different types of uh, objects. And I have to say that uh, I've been very influenced recently by Laura Ogden's work, uh, Loss and Wonder at uh, uh, the World's End on um, um, ecological change uh, and species loss in, the, in Tierra del Fuego. And she does exactly this. She brings together all sorts of material to, uh, you know, document uh, loss and wonder. Um, and um, I quite like that book. I recommend it. Uh, Thank you so much. I think I will have to have a separate conversation with you about telegraph instruments and yes. sea cables because I'm really into that. Um, but uh, Tabitha, is there anything that you'd like to add to that as a uh, you know, lecturer in library and archive studies? <laughs> Um, well, I think there is a way of linking the textual, the records that we've looked at with the, in this case, the fossils that are being described. And that's the emotive side. And I think that's really come out from, I mean, what Amelia said. And it came out to me as I was reading these, um, these things are not just words, they're large, hefty material objects. And as you saw, they're not always that easy to read. But what really springs off the page, a bit like it does when you're reading um, Hook in, in the 17th century, what really springs off the page is this infectious enthusiasm and utter confidence that the methods that these people were using were the ones that should be used. Now we would question that. For example, um, I was reading one of these last night. There was somebody who talked about, well, in fact, it was the secretary. I think perhaps the secretary's patients had been worn thin by the long enumerations of various insects and finds of the um, committee that he was recording. Um, he then recorded in potentially slightly sarcastic language the fact that one of the members has excitedly had the opportunity to remove lice from a bird and the lice were being preserved and he invited a secretary, anybody in the society who wished to, to come and examine these lice and it was recommended. Um, there's this sense of, of the emotional activity, uh, the emotional element. And I think that's what, what, what links the, the words in these books with the, um, with, with the physical objects in the, in the museum. Well, thank you for that. That's such a great example. And to know that the kind of passive aggressive minute note <laughs> preceded our century. Um, no, I just, exactly. I just oh, wanted to add something because I remember now when Tabitha mentioned actually with the fossils uh, as well. If you look at the images, you can't really tell how heavy these teeth are. Uh, but if you handle them for half a day, you know, lift them, 
know, to photograph them, for example, you will soon realize that they're quite heavy, five between five to 10 kilograms, one specimen, right? And it, it's a very, you know, it, it, it's a very uh, bodily experience, right? <laughs> you have to, you know, you can, may end up with back pain, right? <laughs> Just by handling fossils uh, for several hours. So it's something that you don't get to experience if you're just uh, sitting down and reading about them, you know. No, it's it's physical labor, isn't it? And that's really interesting as well to write to to see those histories and to see how people would have, you know, that that's something which which links us to the people that were, you know, transporting them here exactly. and sending them back home. I was very yeah. struck with the sending them back home uh, yes. point that you made. Okay, so um, Sasha, thanks you for the reference. I thank you for the reference. I wrote it down. I hope everybody did. Um, so I think we, we're coming to the end of our time, but I just like to thank you both for that amazing presentation that's really opened up some more of the university's collections to me um and you know i hope that we can carry on these conversations um i'd like to thank all of the audience uh, and also as ever to thank the amazing tech team the epa team and kelly who have kept this running so seamlessly especially with two remote people in it this time um so our next seminar will take place on the 23rd of may and that will be Marina Poveda Escolano and Elizabeth Carr, who will be talking about the ancient and modern lives of an ancient Egyptian uh, papyrus. So you'll find more details about this on our What's On page on the Rylands website, and then you can register from there onto the Eventbrite page as usual. So um, thank you all for joining us again. Thank you again to our brilliant speakers, and we hope we'll see you all again on the 23rd of May. Thank you.